Thanks so much. There is no joy, no sorrow, no victory, no defeat that you have experienced that has not been experienced by literally billions of human beings before you. The birth of a child. This is my child, happiest day in my life. The loss of a loved one. Winning a race. Coming in last. Hitting a peak. A sudden setback. We as feeling, thinking creatures know what joy is. We know what happiness is. And we know pain and we know loss. And we know on the spectrum which state of being is optimal. So why, I wonder, why do we so often choose what is not optimal? Why do we choose to inflict it on others, on ourselves, on our environment? Is it deliberate? Is it politically motivated? Is it philosophically motivated? Do we even know in the moment what we are doing and what the consequences are? Marcel Proust wrote in In Search of Lost Time, it is always thus impelled by a state of mind which is destined not to last that we make our irrevocable decisions. The crisis of addiction, the profound crisis of gun violence in our society, our disregard for nature, the raw way we communicate with each other. And this, as a communicator, is what I would like to talk to you about today. In this world of instant news and social media, we all know how much can go wrong. And I think it's crucial for those who are at the center of the storm, as for instance, our political leaders are, to know exactly the right thing to say and to know precisely what not to say and when to be silent. So I think it's interesting that in so many cases, those who would invite themselves into our conversations, either through political discourse or social media in general, would choose to say things that in a polite society would be considered utterly unacceptable under the cloak of authenticity. Some would say this is a rebellion against political correctness. This is a rebellion against the thought police. But to challenge the now politically correct value of being politically incorrect, I wonder if it's something else. Are we too impatient to pause and choose our words? Are we too lazy to make the effort? Or is it something else? Are we heading down a road to no return? where we have lost the capacity as a society to engage each other with kindness and respect. Ask yourself, how much unvarnished authenticity, how much unvarnished raw honesty are you willing to take? And at the heart of all these points I'm trying to make is words. The late author, Ursula Le Guin, said this. Words are events. They do things. They change things. They transform both speaker and hearer. They feed energy back and forth and amplify it. They feed understanding or emotion back and forth and amplify it. And there are all kinds of really fun exercises that show this. This is one. Punctuation saves lives. <laughs> the difference between let's eat grandma as opposed to let's eat comma grandma. But this I think is my favorite exercise. Taking this core sentence, insert the word only anywhere in the sentence and see how it changes the meaning. So the core sentence is she told him that she loved him. 
She only told him that she loved him. She told him that she loved only him. The truth is, the most widely read books, the most ancient civilization, reflect the value of the polished self. And as you know, museums are filled with the evidence of human desire over thousands of years to project beauty and to project strength. The most popular philosophical and religious treatises of all times are filled with stories of positive human striving. So why, I wonder? Why do we choose to bring the raw version of ourselves instead of bringing the most thoughtless version of ourselves? the most unfinished version of ourselves, why not bring the best version of ourselves? Because the truth is, civilization at one time prized the aesthetic value of self-presentation, the genteel thought, the considered word. It is a goal that reflects intention and mirrors today's mindfulness movement and its sibling, do no harm, which calls upon us to consider the social, the biological, the environmental impact of our actions and our words. I'd like to say here that this picture, which I think is so gorgeous, was taken by a friend of mine, award-winning British wildlife photographer George Stoyle, as are some of the coming pictures. And this is something that I think is so gorgeous when people share their view of the world through their eyes. And I'm so appreciative of this. But can we say that do no harm is an adequate approach? Is it enough? Because it really is an approach that says, look, we can only do so much, so let's just not make matters worse. When the truth is, our society, our civilization is in crisis, and it calls upon us to take action, to repair what's been broken, what's been lost in terms of civility, in terms of harmony, and certainly in terms of the environment. So to an encouraging degree, there are restoration efforts of all kinds around the world. And I think that besides being an absolute goal in and of itself, Environmental restoration is a great metaphor for the restoration of our civil environment. So, I would like to close with this unlikely champion. The oyster. Which goes beyond its call of simple existence and its call to do no harm to actually doing profound good from the Pacific Northwest to the coast of Maine to the Chesapeake Bay and to European waters. This humble bivalve is at the center of efforts not just to hold the line on environmental degradation, but to actually lift marine environments and restore them to their quality and to their beauty. On this quiet strip of beach in the Scottish Highlands, between the Glenmorangie Distillery and the North Sea, a collaboration is underway among scientists, business, and conservationists to restore this European marine sanctuary, the Dornick Firth, to its pre-industrial state of health through a combination of 21st century technology and the restoration of a long gone oyster reef four million deep. You know, I think that there is a synchronicity to our lives and to our world. And I believe that there is a symmetry to our lives and to our world. And so I really believe that we, as human beings, can be like the oyster in our society. We can be that breath of oxygen. We can bring that energy. This is an approach that was embraced by the late Pope John Paul II, and I believe that it speaks to what I think 
is the road before us. This thought paraphrased by this author. Every day of our lives is lived in the dramatic tension between who we are and who we should be. We have the ability to apply ourselves to the challenges ahead of us, to use our muscle, our oxygen, our kindness, to bring us back to a place where words were not meant to bruise, but words were meant to build, to heal, to be positive, to restore our communication to values of clarity, elegance, discretion, consideration, and empathy. Thank you.